Good afternoon, everybody, and a happy new year to you all and uh, to all of the audience here this afternoon for the first webinar uh, of the year 2023 as part of our monthly AWARE webinar series. And I'm delighted this afternoon to, to welcome along uh, Ellen Jennings, the communications officer at Bodywise, who are the Eating Disorders Association of Ireland, to have a conversation together about the exploration of eating disorders and mental health. So before we get into the conversation together this afternoon, I'd just like to, first of all, welcome you along and invite you to uh, get yourself settled into the space that you're in and to uh, take your time to kind of tune in and enjoy the conversation that we're going to have. And in saying that, I'm very conscious of the subject matter as well. So if you're triggered or impacted by the subject matter this afternoon, the first part of call we always recommend to people is to reach out to someone uh, of support in their life, whether that's in their personal life or to a GP, you know, and, and also obviously we'll be talking about Bodywise as an organization. So that might be an organization for you to tune into if you felt as though it was suitable or helpful to you. You know, we always encourage people at AWARE to reach out to help for help, you know, to improve their uh, situation if they're uh, experiencing difficulties with whatever the situation is. So I'm delighted, as I say, you know, to, to introduce uh, Ellen and just to in invite you into the, to the conversation now, Ellen, and tell us uh, a little bit about your role at Bodywise and, and also maybe a little bit about what Bodywise does. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, we're delighted to be here to be able to share some information around eating disorders and mental health. Um, as you said, I work for Bodywise, so we're the national voluntary organisation that supports people affected by eating disorders and their families. Um, so we provide a range of different support services and we do webinars like this. We do talks in schools. Um, it's important, I suppose, to say that people don't need a diagnosis to avail of our support services. So they're welcome to get in touch even if they just want to, you know, start a conversation, talk things through, if they're concerned about someone they know, or if they're concerned about something themselves, they're very welcome to use our support services and we can um, talk through what the next steps might be for the person. Um, you've already acknowledged, I suppose, that what we're discussing is a sensitive topic to talk mm -hmm. about and it's very complex. So, you know, our support services are available at any time um, if you want to talk through anything that we discussed today. And, um, you know, if you would like to just speak through what might be going on um, for you. So my name is Ellen and I'm the communications officer at Bodywise. So I would be involved in a lot of different aspects of our work at Bodywise um, in terms of speaking at events like this and um, social media and our website, which is and contains a lot of information around eating disorders and can be a useful starting point for people to learn more about eating disorders. And, and what do you think that uh, we, we need to, you know, if I was to start a bit more broadly, you know, what do you think we need at, at a societal level to uh, think about in terms of disordered eating, you know, and, and as you said in, in our previous conversation, you know, the continuum or the, the trajectory, you know, the movement between disordered or on, on unhealthy eating, if that's the right way of putting it, you know, and an eating disorder. So societally, you know, what, what comes to mind that is, you know, helpful to think about and for us to talk about today? Yeah, so I suppose there can be quite a few misunderstandings around what an eating disorder actually is. And it's important to keep in mind that an eating disorder is a very serious and complex mental health condition. You know, it's not just about the food, it's not just about the person's uh, body or the behaviors that you see on the outside. They're often a symptom of what's really going on for the person underneath. Mm -hmm. So at Bodywise, we think of an eating disorder as a coping mechanism for the person for dealing with um, difficult things in their life that might feel outside of their control the eating mm. disorder offers a sense a false sense of control over um these difficult difficult feelings and they're very complex you know it's it's there's no one cause of an eating disorder um, mm. there are multiple different aspects and they can affect uh multiple different aspects of a person's life um mm. i think what we often try to keep at the forefront is that it recovery is possible from an eating disorder. Um, 
but we need to address the different aspects of the disorder in order to move towards recovery. Mm, very good, very good. Thank you, Ellen. And when you say, could you say a little bit more about that idea of a false sense of control? You know, because that was one of the words in doing some uh, uh, preparation and thinking about this webinar that came to mind, because we can all, all of us can, you know, control what we uh, ingest and take into our mouths, you know, to, to eat or to drink. You know, and it's a kind of both a conscious and unconscious decision at one sense. But, you know, this idea of control, if you could say a little bit more about that, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. So what might be helpful here is to actually look at the different aspects of a life of the person's life that the eating disorder can impact. So we will often yes. break it down <clears throat> into the thoughts that the person is experiencing, the behaviors that we see on the outside um, the emotions that are underneath for the person and then of course the physical aspect so there's no one look of what an eating disorder looks like and that can be a societal kind of perception as well as that there's a certain look um, to an eating disorder and we know that that's not the case um, so they're very difficult actually to understand and this um, control aspect is only one element of what's going on for the person as well so yes <clears throat> Both from the outside perspective, looking in, it's difficult to understand. And also for the person, it's difficult to understand what they're experiencing. So if we go into the different aspects and we think of the thoughts, first of all, the thinking can become very black and white, all or nothing, mm -hmm. extreme um, type of thinking. Mm -hmm. And there can be a lot of rules in the person's mind around what they can and can't um, do what they should and shouldn't do this word should is a big word in the vocabulary of an eating disorder and it's something mm. that we try to move away from as the person moves mm. away from that control that the eating disorder has over them so when we think of um, the emotional aspect that's often at the core of the eating disorder so that's the feelings that the person is experiencing underneath and that becomes entangled with these thoughts and um behaviors and the feelings behaviors and thoughts all interplay together to create this storm in the person's mind I suppose or a knot that it's difficult to untangle from each other um, and in the beginning the control aspect the person feels that they have this sense of control over something in their life as you said they're controlling maybe their food their exercise trying to control their body um, but it's a false sense of control because over time, as the eating disorder becomes more entrenched, it becomes more and more difficult for the person to meet the rules and regulations that the eating disorder voice has set. Yes. So in that way, <clears throat> the eating disorder then actually begins to take control of the person. They feel they must engage in these behaviors and they must meet these unrealistic expectations in order to feel okay. So what starts out as a control mechanism and a coping mechanism to feel okay, then becomes, they need this to feel okay. Mm -hmm. And that's where it can get a bit, a bit tricky for the person. Um, and recovery from an eating disorder involves addressing each of the different elements and trying to untangle that knot in the person's mind of the different elements of the eating disorder um, to let go of the control that the eating disorder has over the person's life and to allow them to live a life um, in a way that they want to live and not governed by you know the rules that the eating disorder has set and it can be really difficult to get away from that um, and it takes yes. time there's ups and yes. downs but it's possible takes time that's that's you know and that message of recovery is is very uh, helpful to espouse and to speak out about ellen uh, this afternoon you know that people can uh, work through this and come through it even though it takes time and and not to underestimate the hold that the eating disorder can take on a person as you say when it kind of uh, flips into that kind of eating disorder space you know it's as though a person controls what they're eating but then in the continuum or develops into the disordered eating takes control of the person because of that bar keeps going higher and that unrealistic because once the bar keeps moving, 
it's never attainable. It's this idea of something being perfect or that all or nothing thing you talked about, black or white, and I either meet that or I don't meet it. And if you keep moving the bar, you're never going to meet it. Yeah, I think what you've said there around perfection, that's something that um, we hear a lot. People want to be perfect at the eating disorder as well. And that's where it Mm. can feel like if the eating disorder is no longer quote unquote working for them in terms of they're using it as a coping mechanism and it's being an effective coping mechanism for the person in terms of serving to numb or distract from certain emotions and then it becomes too difficult for the person to keep up this unrealistic um, routine I suppose that they have set it then becomes um, they feel that they are failing at it and there's a sense of shame and guilt that comes along with that Um, often people with eating disorders will have um, kind of an anxious personality type or um, a perfectionistic personality type they're often high achievers so that sense of failing can be really difficult for the person um you mentioned there about disordered eating and an eating disorder and that existing mm. on a spectrum and i suppose disordered eating in and of itself can be very difficult for people as well um even in the absence of a, an eating disorder diagnosis um And oftentimes people can relate to these different disordered behaviors at different points in their life. Maybe they decided to go on a diet at some point in their life or, you know, they um, decided to skip a meal or something like that. You know, these are things that um, Mm. the world around us sometimes pushes in terms of um, diet culture and trying to meet these expectations and um, where this kind of slips over into the realm of an eating disorder is where that compulsion aspect comes into it so it's no longer a choice for the person they feel that they need to engage in these behaviors and they must engage in these behaviors in order to feel okay and able to cope yes yes Ellen and this idea that should and must have uh, very strong links I must do this I should do this and if I don't do this I am you know x a bad person or i am unhealthy you know so the thinking becomes uh, wonky and crooked or as we say at aware you know that unhelpful uh, style of thinking you know and i was just thinking to use that word again i suppose about the idea that um yeah the bar can't be reached because it keeps changing uh, onwards and and in an ongoing way i think you've d- described it very um helpfully Ellen, what, what, what the pathway or the journey in it can look like for people, you know, just to tune into that word again, compulsion, you know, it's the, the idea, I suppose you're saying is, is that a person would feel compelled to engage in, in that um, uh, disordered eating. Yeah, so they, when we come back to it as a coping mechanism, that compulsion mm. aspect is where the eating disorder, I suppose, has taken control of the person as opposed to the person feeling in control um so a stigma that exists is that um eating disorders are a choice and we know that that's not the case a person wouldn't choose to live in this way and even when the person can acknowledge that something is not quite right with their relationship with food and their body it is still very difficult for the person to move away from the eating disorder they can't choose not to have the eating disorder um so it's a process of unlearning some of the rules and um recognizing i suppose the emotions excuse me that are coming up underneath for the person so um that's not in isolation oh i'm sorry yeah no you're right it's not in isolation um i suppose there's a lot of different things going on for the person and um other diagnoses can coexist with uh, the diagnosis of an eating disorder as well so you know when we break it down into the different aspects of the eating disorder they need to be addressed um as entities in themselves as well so that's why a multidisciplinary team is really important in uh, the mm-hmm. treatment of an eating disorder to look at those different aspects and to break down how that eating disorder is functioning for that person because no two eating disorders are the same um, And how it functions for the person will differ and the different aspects that the person might need to work on um, in order to move away from the control that the eating disorder has over them 
might differ. Very helpful. And just to, to take a little, a little moment now to uh, share with the audience, you know, to invite you, if you have a question or a comment to make that uh, I, I could put to Ellen a little bit later on in our, in our conversation this afternoon, please use the Q&A box to uh, enter the question or, or uh, thought that you have. And, and we won't be able to have time to get to everything, you know, uh, and yet I'll, I'll do my best to field as uh, many questions as possible to Ellen about the subject of, of uh, eating disorders and mental health. And, and tuning into that space now, I suppose, Alan, of eating disorders and mental health, if, if we were to, you know, obviously here at AWARE, you know, we work with people who are experiencing depression, uh, low mood, bipolar disorder, you know, so I suppose if, if you were to tune in or to share some of your thoughts on the idea of um, the overlap between uh, depression and, and eating disorders, what, what, what would you say? Yeah, so... Um... We know that I suppose that depression is one of the most common mental health diagnoses to co-occur with eating disorders. There are many similar features between the two um, and people experiencing eating disorder are they often find it difficult to talk about their feelings and they may experience these symptoms of depression as part of their eating disorder. Um, the relationship that they have between each other is very different depending on each individual eating disorder. As I mentioned, everyone's eating disorder is different. Mm. So when we think um, about the two, there are some similar features in terms of that thinking. So there can be that extreme and pervasive negative thinking, that hopelessness, um, guilt, decreased interest in socializing. These are all common, I suppose, to both. But with an eating disorder, these elements will be uh, centered around control over food and their body whereas with um, depression I suppose they might be more broad so the two um, can coexist together and I suppose when we think of eating disorders existing on a spectrum and disordered eating being something that maybe many people can relate to um, in terms of experiencing it at some point in their life mm -hmm. People can experience um, stages in their life of feeling low or feeling down, but they might not necessarily have a clinical diagnosis of depression. So the two exist kind of in that way. And there's a bi-directional relationship between the two in terms of um, sometimes the depressed, the um, clinical di depression can exist before the eating disorder. And in this mm -hmm. case, it can prevent and be a barrier towards recovery with an eating disorder. So that needs to be addressed as a, as a separate entity. I understand. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, whereas if the depression is part of the eating disorder in terms of, um, I suppose, what if, maybe if we think about how that might show up for the person. So um, the person uses the eating disorder as a coping mechanism and that can help them to feel okay and then mm. when the eating disorder no longer works for them as this coping mechanism those feelings of um low mood and depression mm. can often be a part of that cycle and oftentimes when a person is in the height of their eating disorder and the eating disorder is working for them quote unquote um they won't experience these low moods because it is functioning as the coping mechanism for them yes. uh, during that time. So it can be difficult to... Yeah, that's um, what makes it kind of confusing or a bit paradoxical, I suppose, yeah. in a way, you know, that something, uh, you know, around disordered eating be, uh, as, as a coping mechanism is seen internally by the person as something that is working for them or is, you, you, you know, paying off. There's a payoff. Yeah. What I've heard recently, actually, from someone with lived experience was around January and how every January would come around and um, everyone would be engaging in their, you know, New Year's resolutions. There's often a lot of um, talk around dieting or uh, New Year, New Me type of thinking. And yes. this person said that every whenever January came around, they felt like, oh, they had this thing here that they could use to cope. So the eating disorder for them made them feel like they were in control. It made them feel like they had this 
thing that they could use to get through January and you know everyone else just didn't have that sense of control and um I suppose then it was when the eating disorder began to become too much for the person they then realized that it wasn't working for them and that um the feelings that they maybe had been suppressing through the eating disorder then all came to the surface again after that um and became very difficult for the person when they that's why I think oftentimes in recovery from an eating disorder it can often feels like feel like things are getting worse before they get better because all the feelings and um emotions that are underneath the eating disorder come to the surface yeah and having to deal with them is very painful Mm -hmm. and powerful and yet trying to hold on to the hope that that idea of recovery and it's not about being blasé because you've mentioned a little bit earlier that there are ups and downs or lapses back into uh, uh, the behaviors around an eating disorder but then you know that kind of one step forward one to the side one back and everyone's journey through it is different of Mm -hmm. course because we're all unique individuals if you were to step back a little bit I suppose now and try and think about if a person was wondering about their relationship with food, you know, and uh, thinking or, or, you know, very often and, and very helpfully we hear that the ideas of, and, and we try to uh, espouse this at AWARE around early intervention or prevention. So how, how would you kind of typically see if a person, you know, because at the broad range of where everyone is in their relationship, because we all, uh, every person has a relationship with food, bar none, because we need it to fuel ourselves so, uh, and, and to survive. So um, how, how would a person come to know that their eating was becoming maybe, if I was to say, problematic or different to how it was normally? I know you've referenced the time of, of, of the year and that might be prevalent, you know, after you know, the societal idea of excess in December and then January can be a little bit kind of self-flagellation, I suppose, and punishing. And I have to, uh, you know, and you see it in relation to, which is another uh, uh, substance, you know, the drinking of alcohol, you know, excess perhaps in December and then dry January, which is, there's a lot of messaging in society around that. But notwithstanding that, linking it to eating, what, what would your sense be about kind of, I suppose what I'm getting at is how does a person become a little bit more aware? Or how do we all? Yeah, so I suppose I mentioned around disordered eating and different elements that a lot of people can probably relate to and how that can slip over into an eating disorder. So I suppose what I'm taking from what you said is kind of when can a person person acknowledge that something is... is Sorry, there's an echo on my side here. I don't know. No, it's okay. I'm, it's, Is it okay on your side? It's okay on my side, yeah. Okay. Um, that something's not quite right for them, I suppose. When is that point or when can, what different flags kind of come up that they can... Exactly, Ellen, that's it. Right. Yes, that's okay. it. Okay. So I suppose when we come to the different elements of the how an eating disorder functions, so there's firstly that thinking element so oftentimes the person will become you know preoccupied with thoughts about food and a need to control their body shape and size in some way so we often hear that the thinking that can take up a lot of the thinking capacity in the person's mind that those thoughts around food and exercise and rules in the person's mind can start to become more and more um the person might have a distorted body image um they may view themselves to be a certain way when in reality they may not actually appear that way. Um, the person might be caught in a cycle, you know, this time of year, as I mentioned around um, the new year, people can often engage in dieting. And we know that dieting is uh, one of the major risk factors for the development of an eating disorder. And that restriction that comes along with, often comes along with uh, dieting can then lead to feelings of um, being caught in a cycle because the binging will then, sorry, the restriction will often then lead to a binge, which is then followed by feelings of shame and guilt around that, which then serves to bring the person back to the beginning of the cycle where they feel they need to restrict again in order to have that sense of control over something. And then it 
the cycle continues. So it can be really difficult for the person in that way. Um, other things, I suppose, that come up on our services in terms of um, things to, to be aware of around disordered eating is a change in mood. So that, ter that emotional element, um, the person may get stressed very easily. They may have a difficulty coping with a change in routine. They may have very regimented routine around what they're going to do each day. And um, if plans change, it can be really difficult for the person. So a marked change in personality is a big uh, part of that. And then in terms of the physical side of things, I suppose, lacking in energy um, menstrual issues can be a symptom of that disordered eating. Um, feeling the cold a lot is something else that comes up, digestive issues. And then um, a marked change in weight over a period of time. So that's not necessarily uh, in one direction or another. It's just that um, weight change um, over a period of time. So there can be a lot of different signs and symptoms uh, for a person around uh, when things are becoming a little bit more than just that um, quote unquote. My normal. sense of what might happen for a person is, is that things can develop very quickly perhaps and uh, this word shame is so important to use I think Ellen in, it, in that it's a very um, see it becomes very secretive you know or the idea that uh, reaching out for support around it this uh, coming back to early intervention and when you feel that that sense of because linked with control is power, I suppose. So the power that the eating disorder takes over the person, perhaps, but the power that the person feels around controlling that as a coping mechanism, you know, uh, and, and the shame linked with that. They're very potent or powerful forces, I suppose, that leads to this developmental trajectory for for an eating disorder. Yeah, and I think um, oftentimes some of the disordered eating behaviors can be normalized in society as well which right. you know the person then doesn't can't recognize I suppose that what they're doing isn't helpful for them someone who is unwell might not recognize that um some public health messaging might not apply to them because oftentimes it can be kind of a blanket message that everyone should be you know um exercising this amount everyone should be eating in this way and for someone who's unwell they can take that um, very specifically and literally to them. And in terms of acknowledging that something's not quite right, this can be a really difficult step for people, whether they're able to recognize that within themselves or people around them are concerned um, about them. Uh, because recognizing it, I suppose, brings to the surface that, um, you know, maybe something is, isn't uh, right here. Maybe I, um, you know, what I mentioned earlier about when the control element of it and the coping mechanism is working for the person, they might not recognize yeah. that something is not quite right. Um, yes. And it can be really, really difficult to open up about feelings like this, exactly, especially when Ellen. it's confusing to yourself as well, you know? And, and what do you do to encourage people to open up? Like what, what, what kind of, yeah, I suppose you encourage them to open up, but what kind of ideas do you have at BodyWise for people with disordered eating to open up? Yeah, so I suppose the first step is that opening up the conversation piece. So we might get a message from someone who is a little bit concerned, uh, but they don't really know what's going on. So that making that initial contact can actually be one of the most difficult steps because the person often doesn't know what to say. They don't know how to open up the conversation. They mightn't have said it to anyone before or acknowledged it to themselves. And sending that email or sending that message can be um, making things seem quite real for the person. So I think once... Um, something that's important for people to be aware of is that they can just send a message to talk things through. It doesn't; they don't need a diagnosis, I suppose, to avail of our of our support services. Um, it might be that they open up to us, and then from there we talk things through what the next steps might be for the person when they feel ready. We will always say everything, all the information that we offer. Um, the person doesn't need to engage with any of this. It's just information because sometimes it can be very overwhelming to get a lot of information at once. Um, 
So opening up that conversation is that first step and talking through the feelings that are going on for the person as opposed to the behaviors. Yes, yes. And, and this idea of coming out of a place of denial and by extension of that, if a loved one is part of the audience here, you know, if someone's here as a concerned person for uh, their loved one who is in their eyes engaged in disordered eating, you know, uh, I, I, am I right in saying that coming out of a place of pretending it's not there, but also what kind of ideas have you got to, to suggest about having that first, maybe perhaps initial conversation that is very, very taxing and emotionally heavy, I suppose, you know, um, and, you know, because I'm, I'm conscious that there, there is more than likely people in the audience who are here as a concerned person for a loved one with disordered eating. perhaps. Yeah. yeah, it can be really difficult to know what to say in these situations. And there's no right or wrong way, um, I suppose, of doing so and opening up that conversation and focusing on those feelings that are coming up for the person. So you know, you might notice the behaviors on the outside, but it's important to um, kind of think through what might really be going on for the person. Maybe it's about informing yourself around eating disorders before you make that initial uh, comment to the person about your concern. Um, and from there, I suppose we, we do have a family support program as well here at BodyWise. And in that, you can learn kind of communication tips and learning how to support someone who might not necessarily be ready to acknowledge that something is not quite right um, with their relationship with food and their body. Um, because it can almost be like, learning a new language in terms of how to to speak around this um yes yeah so it can be it can be really difficult for people when they feel that um it's outside of their control as well um so they're welcome to use our support services to talk things through as well you know it's not just the person themselves with the eating disorder that will use our support services we will often have families um reach out and explain their situation and talk through the next steps. Yeah, that's great. It's so helpful to hear, you know, the, the wide ranging uh, options that you have, you know, and that space for family members or concerned persons to, to reach out to you about their loved ones uh, disordered eating. Just to, to, to move it on a little bit now, uh, Ellen, to think about what, what would you see as being the risk factors for, uh, I think we've touched on them a little bit in the conversation, but the risk factors for uh, eating disorder. Yeah, so I mentioned that dieting is one of the major risk factors as well as um, low self-esteem. So I suppose it's important to keep in mind that there's no one cause of an eating disorder. Um, yes. So there are a number of risk factors, both internal to the person and external to the person that play a role. And when we think of the different, how complex the eating disorder is and the different elements of a person's life that the eating disorder can impact on, the risk factors are equally complex and equally um, diverse. There's a huge range of different factors that can play a role. So when we think of some specifics, um, it might be things internal to the person, such as um, genetics. There are certain um, genetics that mm -hmm. predispose a person um, to coping in this way, I suppose. Um, the person might have a tendency towards all or nothing thinking, an anxious personality type um, or yes. perfectionism. Um, oftentimes the person will be very sensitive to other people's emotions as well. Um, and low self-esteem can be a risk factor. And then yeah. the world around us plays a role, things that are external to the person. So yeah. things in the person's life, such as um, social media, um, the media, different family situations and the environment that the person finds themselves in um, all can play a role. Uh, when we think of social media for people with eating disorders, it can be a difficult space mm. in terms of body image and these unrealistic ideals that are perpetuated, but also it can be a positive space in terms of people's recovery they can find a sense of community within that recovery space. Um, so there's pros and cons, I suppose, to it. But I, 
the takeaway here is that eating disorders are very complex and there's no one cause. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, that's very helpful to say. Uh, that's very helpful. And in terms, I suppose, of, of, of treatment and recovery, you know, what kind of messages do you deliver and um, put out there at, at, at BodyWise in relation to that um, around treatment and recovery? Obviously, you've spoken about that around recovery being possible and that hope, very hopeful message, which is so important. Yeah, so treatment from an eating disorder involves um, addressing the different aspects of the eating disorder and how they show up for the person. Um, the first step, so once the person has acknowledged that something might not be quite right with their relationship with food and their body, um, maybe they've reached out to our services or they've opened up to someone um, that, they're, that they uh, trust, the next step would often be to visit the GP. So the GP would mm. look after kind of the physical aspect that the eating disorder um, can bring to the surface. And from mm. there, they can refer on to a multidisciplinary team who would look after the other elements. So the thinking aspects, the emotional aspects. So the, the person might be referred on to a psychotherapist. And mm. then in terms of um, the behaviors and um the physical aspect then would be looked after by the GP and maybe a dietitian might come on board to look at some of the um, the relationship with food aspect. So it's a multidisciplinary team is really important to look after all the different aspects of the eating disorder. And then moving towards recovery, you know, it can be a long process. It can have lots of ups and downs along the way and lapses and relapses and um, they can often be a part of the recovery. A way I've heard it described is um, if we imagine the tide coming in and um, you know the, the waves go in and out as the tide comes in, we can imagine recovery in the same way in that there will be ups and downs and in and outs along the way, but the tide is making it to, to the shore um, in the process mm -hmm. of this. So and um, seeing the bigger picture in terms of how far you've come in your recovery and um, trying to be self-compassionate and um, developing other ways of coping and other coping mechanisms to add to your toolbox so that um, when difficult feelings come up, the person has other coping mechanisms that they can use um, alongside uh, what they already have in their toolbox. Adaptive coping mechanisms, I suppose. And this idea, it's really helpful to hear you say, Ellen, around self-compassion, the idea that because it, it, it feels as though when disordered eating takes root or takes hold and then develops perhaps into an eating disorder is that it's far from a self-compassionate voice that's being uh, uh, manifested internally for a person. In fact, quite a punitive you know, a lot of self-berating and self-hatred around how a person seems and looks and uh, that sense of shame that, that it, it, it creates in, in the relationship a person has with themselves. So trying to develop, you know, uh, uh, more of a, of a compassionate voice internally seems to be very helpful in terms of uh, uh, recovery from, from an eating disorder. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you speak about that internal dialogue and that internal voice, that's a huge part of the eating disorder. We often refer to it as the eating disorder voice. Um, and this isn't like an auditory hallucination, but rather, as you said, that internal critic, you know, it has a lot of rules and expectations and it can be very loud in the person's mind. Part of sure. recovery is... Um, amplifying the more rational side of the person's mind and uh, creating some distance between themselves and this inner internal critic. And oftentimes we can hear that people maybe put a name on this internal critic or refer to it as it to create that distance between the person ah. themselves and the eating disorder voids. Um, mm. And that can be helpful for family members as well. So that, you know, the sense of, um, shame or blame around this eating disorder is directed at the eating disorder voice and that aspect as opposed to the person themselves because when the eating disorder is controlling the person as opposed to the other way around 
they don't have control over what that eating disorder is saying they must do. So that can be helpful in terms of recovery as well. Very Separate good, very out. helpful. Ellen. Separate it out, yeah, this word must again and should. Yeah. And there is quite a level of toxicity to do with those two words because they're very um, punitive and, and self-punitive that we should do or must do. And, you know, it feels helpful that you've used that, that language again. And just to field a couple of questions now that have come in from the audience this afternoon, you know, and, and just wondering, Ellen, about the incidence or percentage of eating disorders in, in, in men, uh, to the best of your knowledge, or maybe from some research that you've done. Yeah, so this is something that we're um, bringing more and more light to, I suppose, because we know that eating disorders exist in, um, they can happen in any person of any uh, gender, race, ethnicity, you know, it's not something that discriminates. And um, when we think about men, there's a stigma that has existed historically um, that eating disorders are a female illness. And we know that, that that's not the case. So this coupled with the difficulties um, for men, I suppose, in speaking out about having a mental health condition can make it very difficult for um, people to speak out about experiencing an eating disorder and I think for men as well it can show up maybe in a little bit of a different way or it can show up in a similar way as well um, so in terms of statistics around eating disorders it can be really difficult to get accurate statistics because of the nature of the condition the secrecy that can go along with it and the difficulty in um, getting a diagnosis around that because of the stigma that that may have existed so Historically, it was one in 10 was the figure for men, but we believe that it is much more than that, actually, because um, of this difficulty in getting accurate statistics and what we would see on our own services as well. And um, more and more men opening up about their experience with an eating disorder. And um, when I talk yeah. about the, the differences between the two, sometimes there can be a difference in these body image ideals between male and female and that can feed into um, kind of how the eating disorder shows up for the person. There's a few comments from the audience in relation to social media playing a part. Is there anything else that you'd like to say on that, you know, around Instagram or influencers, people who might be selling uh, diet pills, uh, you know, without medical advice, you know, and, and does that come up in body wise with people who use your services? You know, and then there's a specific point. So that's one point. And then the specific point is made around, you know, about um, having this idea. Again, the word perfect is in, in the question or the comment. And, uh, you know, the idea of Instagram and um, uh, selfies and, and, and that. And what advice you might have, you know, and body image linked to maybe um, people who may be getting dental treatment or, you know, like that maybe or have internalized perhaps I'm, I'm surmising now that the idea that they don't look well and how that links to eating I think what might be at play there maybe and, and correct me if I'm wrong is the idea that um it's around how a person looks and uh that by con perhaps by controlling eating the other uh, it's it, it basically the eating disorder or the, the difficulty with eating isn't in isolation again yeah so um, when we talk about social media, we'll often talk about that link with body image and um, how we feel about our, our body and the comparisons that we can make to people on social media. Um, you know, there's a huge number of images and videos and pictures and we're exposed to these consistently, you know, on a daily basis. So it's important that yes. um, our feed is supportive of our mental health as opposed to having a negative impact on our mental health so you know checking in with how you're feeling after being exposed to certain um feeds or um in terms of recovery sometimes people can tailor their feed and unfollow or mute certain accounts that they feel not, not necessarily be so helpful for them but you know it's not a a point of not seeing either because it's very difficult to avoid this diet culture that's in our our world all around us um so in terms of developing a more positive body image and trying to mitigate against the negative impacts that some of this uh can have so there's 
it's a wrap but coming back again to self-compassion and yes. trying to um recognize that these images that you see online are often maybe unrealistic they might be edited they're a snapshot of a person's day they're not showing the full picture um and how in reality people's lives might look much different than that um so i suppose that's part of that reframing of of what we're seeing and not taking it really at face value but really thinking um the background of that and trying to see the bigger picture and not see it as um you know that this person's life is perfect because we know that that's not the case um and how we do that i suppose in terms of body image and improving your body image um coming back to body functionality and what your body can do for you that's um not focused on appearance solely is an important yes. aspect of that um and things like being aware of um being preoccupied around our body image and anxiety and shame that can come up around that um so it's that body image piece that really is linked um with social media and uh, in that way i hope that answers the question in some that way does, yeah, that's helpful yeah that's helpful indeed there's uh, uh, an attendee in the audience who's uh, wondering about if you could talk, Ellen, about eating disorders or disordered eating in, in teenage boys and body image issues becoming more common, especially around those involved in sport. Yeah, that teenage and adolescent stage in a person's life can be really difficult because it's a period of change in the person's body. It might be the first time that their body has come kind of into their own focus and focus of people around them. Um, it's also a time, you know, you might be in an environment in, in a school or there might be different um, elements in the person's life that are difficult, such as bullying or um, mm -hmm. weight related teasing, you know, this um, weight stigma can be part of, of what a person experiences in, in the world around them. So coupled with pressures to meet certain body ideals this can be a, a difficult experience for a young person um that link with exercise again you know we know that um movement is important for our mental health and our physical health but it's that relationship to that movement um, does the person feel like they have to engage in a certain exercise regime um, do they feel like they need to go for this exercise um, a certain amount? Um, is there a number that they're trying to meet? You know, is there specifics in terms of that? Do they feel that they must engage in this behavior? That's where it crosses over into a more difficult relationship with exercise. Are they using exercise as a way to change something about their body shape or size? Um, their relationship with food are they're very strict in the way that they um their relationship with food and their body yeah. so these are the different elements to kind of look at and maybe to have a discussion about if you are concerned about someone and again not focusing on the behaviors but rather um coming at it from an angle of look i've noticed that you're um you don't seem to be uh, feeling yourself like you're you're mood has been very up and down um, I'm wondering how you're feeling and trying to get at it from that point of view as opposed to mm. maybe what you're seeing on the surface. Thank you Ellen and, and uh, lastly you know do you have any tips on how to tell a loved one that you have an eating disorder that a person has, has from the audience has said that do you have any ideas of how to go about initiating that kind of conversation uh, difficult and all and acknowledging the difficulty of that you know yeah I suppose as we mentioned earlier it can be really difficult to acknowledge that something's not quite right so taking that first step in speaking about it I what I'm hearing from that person's um message is that maybe they have spoken about it um or got a diagnosis, but they haven't said it to their family yet. Perhaps and that, that might be the case, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that can be a difficult um, position to be in because it's it's trying to 
help the the family members to understand what an eating disorder is as well um but I suppose coming back to the feelings underneath and working through what might actually be going on for the person um and opening up about it in that way and maybe sharing some information or offering our support services to the family member if they want to talk through um, how they can help to support the person, maybe offering um, ways that the, the person can get support for themselves as well so that they can uh, be there for the person, uh, I think is important. That sounds helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And acknowledging, you know, coming out this idea, coming back to uh, a space of, of uh, coming out of, of denial, as it were, you know, that painful and uh, tentative as you might be about speaking about uh, the difficulty you're having with eating or an eating disorder that you might be diagnosed with to um, to speak about it is uh you, you know it's not risk free you know there's mm -hmm. going to be obviously consequences of it and maybe uh on in the, the consequences of that you're are, are, you're coming out of a place of control by not saying something or saying style and there's some aspect of control being held on to and yet and um, that isn't necessarily you, you know the wisest or best course of action but you know we're not here to to moralize far from it or to tell people how to live their lives you know um you know, that's not the intention of this discussion or, or, or body wise, I dare say, but certainly not aware. Yeah, yeah. no, I think um, in terms of talking about what might be going on for the person, our support services, we have um, support services where people in recovery can come together to talk about experiences that may, they may have had on that um, journey in recovery. Mm. So it might be a, a place um, to ask someone else who has personal experience of opening up to their family, you know, how they found that and what. Very might, good. Yeah. Excellent. Might, yeah. It might be an, an idea. That, that sounds that sounds so useful. And, and, and just to uh, summarize, maybe you, what you, you know you do, you've said it at the start, Ellen, about what you do at BodyWise, but just to give us a broad uh, picture I suppose of the services that that you do offer you've mentioned them in relation to the family members or the the, the concerned persons might be or loved ones the support there and um, you have a support email service uh, you know so and just to, to give us a, a synopsis of what you offer or what you do at BodyWise. Yeah so we have our website which has a range of different information both for the person themselves for their family for health professionals we offer training for health professionals as well around eating disorders. We offer training for teachers. And um, as I mentioned, our pillar program is for family members, friends, siblings, partners in learning how they can support someone with an eating disorder. Um, and the next pillar family support program actually starts on the 19th um, of January. So that's coming up soon if anyone wants to um, sign up for that we'll have the link uh, below the video and in terms right. of for the person themselves we have our helpline um we have our email support service which is often referred to as um helpline call in an email because the person can really just talk over and back through how things how they're feeling and what might be going on for them we have online support programs um and online support chat groups for young people and for adults. And within the adult support chat group, we have a specific student group. And um, so that's to speak about the experiences that students might have in that transition from um, second level to third level and how that can be for a person with an eating disorder. And then we have a men's group as well for people to speak about experiences that might be unique to men with eating disorders. Uh, we have a newly set up virtual support group as well, which is uh, over Zoom and um, that runs twice monthly as well. So the Bodywise Connect um, chat group runs weekly and the um, virtual support group which is video runs twice monthly so there's a range of different supports and I think it you know it can be overwhelming to take everything on board so if you were to take a first step and um, the email alex at bodywise.ie can be a good place to start and um, 
to gather, you know, different resources together in one place. Well, I just want to th thank you uh, in, in sum, you know, for such a, a wide ranging, insightful and uh, very stimulating conversation and just your the clarity in which you were able to express, you know, the different things that you do, a greater understanding that I also have now from this conversation. And we all at AWARE have, you know, in, in, and the audience included in that, of course, too, you know, around uh, eating disorders and the impact, exploring them and the impact of, on the, of them on one's mental health. So I just want to thank you uh, sincerely for your contribution, Ellen, and uh, yeah, to acknowledge that uh, as, as we finish up the webinar. Thank you, Stephen. It's been a pleasure to be able to speak on the topic and hopefully um, someone will find some of the information useful. And please do feel free to reach out if there's anything that we've discussed that you feel um, you'd like to talk through. Thank you. And with, with that notice, I suppose, from, from Ellen, you know, like you, you have the contact details in, in the audience, you know, and for people watching this webinar back, you know, to reach out to BodyWise for support if it feels as though it's um, going to be beneficial to you. Uh, and also, we always uh, recommend people to um, reach out to their GP uh, should they uh, need support for any mental health difficulty. And that includes, you know, I suppose, the, the aspect of people who are concerned about their eating. Um, just to say to people who are part of the webinar, you know, uh, we invite you to complete a survey at the end of this webinar, which will allow you uh, to give us feedback as we develop this webinar series for 2023, you know, and also for if you're not on our mailing list, we invite you to uh, sign up, go on to our website and sign up uh, for our mailing list, which is aware.ie forward slash webinars. It's a webinar newsletter. So just to announce as well, too, that our February webinar will take place on a different day. It will take place on Thursday, the 9th of February. And we're just uh, finalizing a few finer details to that. But uh, it'll be Thursday, the 9th of February, 2023, just to be confirmed uh, in, in totality at 12 noon. And the subject matter will be mental health and disability, minding your mood. Um, and if you'd like further information about our free support services, our current offering of our free mental health programs, please go to aware.ie. So aware.ie will, and we're launching uh, our own programs on a uh, week beginning Monday, the 23rd of January. So if you're interested in taking part in a relatives and friends program, our living well with bipolar disorder program, or a life skills adult program, please go onto our website to register for one of our educational programs. And without further ado, just to thank Ellen again, and to thank you all as an audience for your contribution and to wish you well in the afternoon ahead. Thank you very much.